It is time for our juicy policy debate, which I am hoping will get you all revved up for, uh, here comes the box of water, um, for the refreshments to follow. You can tell I come from a geeky world where a juicy policy debate is how you get revved up for the refreshments. Uh, <clears throat> Three of my favorite people in front of you today. Climate policy has made great advances in Canada over the past decade. It's undergoing some challenges these days, as I said earlier, but we're going to push through it. Uh, and it has included both carbon pricing and non-pricing policies. All of these policies change incentives in the marketplace toward fewer emissions and the adoption of cleaner technologies. But the question is, do we need even more intrusive policy actions? Do we need governments to dust off and recalibrate their 1970s style industrial policy tools? Or should we be relying on the incentives created by more universal policies, like the carbon price? That is the question. Now our moderator for this juicy policy debate is the only person that I know who I was absolutely certain would keep our two debaters in line and well behaved. Martha Hall Finley. Yay! <laughs> uh, Martha has just recently, a couple of months ago, been appointed as the new director of the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. A great choice for the school given her many years of policy experience. Prior to that appointment, uh, she was Chief Sustainability and Climate Officer for Suncor. Uh, she ran, before that, she ran the Canada West Foundation. Before that, she was a corporate lawyer, a trade expert, a twice elected member of parliament. She has uh, been around a few policy blocks, let's just say that. So she is going to keep our two uh, debaters in line, and she's going to introduce you to them. Uh, and I will just ask her to take it away. Super. Thank you, Chris. Um, and, uh, and thank you to the Walrus and to TELUS uh, and to McGill and the School of Public Policy, which is an awesome institution, Chris. Um, thank you for all that you have done for the School of Public Policy, the Max Bell School. Um, and it's great to be invited to be here. There's a reason why I'm sitting in the middle. I'm told this could get violent. So I need to actually be physically in between these guys. Um, just a quick, I don't know, is Philip still in the room? I just wanted to say I did work in construction and in terms of innovation, there's so little, but I gotta tell you, flashing tape, fantastic. That's been one of the best innovations in construction in a long time, sorry, I, I digress. We have, um, Ken Bosenkul, who's the found, founding partner of MB Policy, but um, has a long, long history, but I, I, there's no way I can do it. You, you, we'll, we'll, we'll get a sense pretty quickly as we get into this. And of course, Rick Smith, who's the president of the Canadian Climate Institute. And um, we, I, I have to say, we actually, we, we should have taped our planning session, because it was pretty... That was good. It was actually really good. I, I actually don't think it's going to get physical, but I'm in the middle just in case. Um, I was asked, we also agreed that it, we, it could be really easy going down a rabbit hole just trying to define what industrial policy is. And so we agreed on the following. Actions by governments that deliberately steer and shape economic activity in a particular sector or industry and or actions that help plan and coordinate market outcomes within these sectors uh, uh, or industries. Um, it was very clear because these guys jumped on me for suggesting the concept of picking winners and losers. That's not what we're doing. And so I just want to make that really, really clear. Um, that's the basis upon which we are starting this conversation. We're going to do uh, openings of a, around seven minutes each. I've told them max seven minutes. Um, rebuttals five minutes each, because we're trying to do this debate format. Um, I'm going to push them a little bit on a couple things, because I have no opinions at all on any of this. Um, and and then we'll shift to audience questions. Um, before, uh, just as a reminder, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll try and do it, if you get up to speak at the mic, if you can introduce who you are and maybe your organization so we have contacts for the question, that would be really helpful. Um, we didn't actually decide who was going to go first. Reverse alphabetical. Reverse alphabetical. 
<laughs> you go, you go, you offered. <laughs> Madam Chair, is it time to begin? It is time to begin, please. All right. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, Chris Reagan. I want to thank the organizers. Uh, I want to thank the walrus. If climate change were easy, uh, it would be solved by now. Uh, so uh, your engagement in this, in this discussion is so important. I also want to begin by saluting my opponent, uh, uh, who has been a friend uh, for many years. Uh, Ken is a fearless, eloquent leader on the topic of uh, climate change progress. Uh, I admire him. I love him like a brother. And for the next hour, he is dead to me. <laughs> but he has great glasses. All right. Uh, so let's get going. Uh, you've heard our agreed definition of uh, in industrial policy. Uh, the evidence I will present today underlines the importance of green industrial policy as one leg of a three-legged climate policy stool. The other legs being uh, market-based approaches, uh, such as industrial carbon pricing and smart regulation. So I have three opening arguments uh, in favor of the central importance of green industrial policy in this mix. First, uh, and I think certainly most important, is that climate change is an urgent challenge. So this element of urgency, of uh, literally existential threat to the human species, distinguishes climate change uh, from other policy challenges. The signs of this escalating crisis are all around us, and I don't need to uh, excruciatingly catalog them, but I did want to touch on a few details here. Last summer's wildfires across Canada scorched an area the size of Portugal, which was an expanse three times larger than the previous record. This winter, of course, uh, was the hottest ever recorded in our country, and this, pro this summer promises to be even more hot and fire-filled than the last. So the impacts of climate change are here, they are escalating, and they're actually measurable. Uh, so if you look at uh, Canadian Climate Institute analysis, you, you can find it online at uh, climateinstitute.ca, uh, by 2025, extreme weather effects will be destroying the equivalent of 50% of our country's annual economic growth. So in accounting terms, uh, these aren't projections any longer. Uh, they are actuals. A few random examples from 2023 alone. Uh, over $3 billion in insured damages, according to the Insurance Bureau of Canada. Uh, about $700 million in unanticipated firefighting costs in British Columbia. Uh, in Halifax alone, about $20 million in cleanup costs from a year of uh, var uh, various fires and flooding. Most importantly, though, the negative impacts of climate change are leading to real injury and death. So over this past summer, 100,000 fire-threatened Canadians had to be evacuated from their homes, including the entire population of one of our capital cities, Yellowknife. 619 Canadians lost their lives as a result of the 2021 BC heat dome. The reason that I say all of this is because when a problem is urgent, when it, when it is literally getting worse by the minute, when it is escalating, it necessitates quick solutions, and green industrial policy can provide those solutions in a direct and focused and strategic way. My second argument uh, is that good climate policy needs to respond to a variety of imperatives, and cost efficiency is only one of them. Uh, so you're gonna be hearing from my opponent, I think, uh, that the ideal policy is market-based, and it's cost efficient. And of course, cost effectiveness uh, is often important, but it is not the sole consideration that should guide the creation of good climate policy. Here's another few considerations uh, that need to factor in. Security is one of them. To state the obvious, uh, Europe cannot rely on Russian natural gas any longer. Uh, quickly replacing this resource at the outset of the Ukraine war required a focused industrial strategy to turbocharge domestic renewable energy production. That strategy is called Repower EU, and it's working. Another, uh, another consideration that needs to factor in is competitiveness. The US decided correctly that China alone uh, couldn't be allowed forever 
to control the world's supply of critical minerals and batteries. And so the Biden administration created the Inflation Reduction Act to incent domestic mining, to incent a new kind of uh, manufacturing uh, on the way to an electrified, lower emission future. That strategy is working, and in fact is the constant uh, focus of, uh, of concern by Canadian industry. Fairness is another important consideration, and when you have some industries, like oil and gas, chronically lagging behind other industries in their efforts uh, to decarbonize, it is fair and necessary to target policies at those industries to expedite that action. So good industrial policy responds to multiple considerations in a way that market mechanisms alone cannot. And bluntly put, Europe would have frozen in the dark after the onset of the Ukraine war if it had to rely solely on market-based, slower-moving policies to secure its energy supply. And that brings me to my third uh, and last argument uh, for, my, for my opening. Uh, we need to take the world as it is, not how classical economists or aficionados of uh, market-based policies wish it were. Uh, and if you ever needed evidence that market-based poli policies like carbon taxes cannot by themselves get us to where we need to go with respect to net zero, just take a look at the Globe and Mail today. Just take a look at the complete carbon tax meltdown happening today in legislatures right across this country. According to recent polling, nearly three-quarters of Canadians say they are worried or very worried about climate change. But when you quiz them on support levels for various policies, a consumer carbon tax is always bottom of the list. So unsurprisingly, in an age of red-hot affordability concerns, most people don't think it's reasonable to be asked to personally pay to clean up climate change. It's just a fact that consumer carbon taxes are relatively unpopular. But you know what is popular? the types of industrial policies, green industrial policies, uh, exemplified in Joe Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, in a recent poll, nearly 90% of Americans, which is incredible if you think about how divided that country is, nearly 90% of Americans support the domestic manufacturing emboldened by that sprawling policy. In addition to broad-based support, I want to add here, Green industrial policy actually also allows you to marshal key constituencies to accelerate climate progress, constituencies like trade unions, industrial trade associations, uh, and this is not something that other policies can do by themselves. So to sum up, the nature of the urgent, complicated policy environment we face at this time of sky-high affordability concerns necessitates using every tool in the climate change toolbox. And green industrial policy responds to this critical moment in a way that other types of policy uh, simply cannot. Thank you very much. I love Rick like a cousin. <laughs> but he's dead to me for the next hour. Um, thanks to everyone who uh, put this on. These are fun. Um, Rick and I occasionally go for lunch and have the kinds of debates we're having here over lunch. So if you ever see us at a cafe, just gather around. Um, I'm going to make four points, um, which are mostly in the form of arguments, but just four points because I think they're critical to the current debate. The, my first point, which you anticipated, Rick, is that I believe in market forces more than I believe in government forces. I believe we should tax what we don't like, not what we like. I actually believe that good climate policy should also be good tax policy. I believe that incentives matter. And on all of these things, I'm finding fewer and fewer friends in the Conservative Party in various guises in Canada, which is perhaps why I am the Executive Director of Conservatives for Clean Growth, jumping up and down and flailing my arms around trying to convince my party to have sensible climate policies. Um, believe it or not, I haven't given up all hope yet. But I do want to make one point to my friends in the Conservative Party that I worry they haven't thought enough about. And so this is less a debating point for you, Rick, although it's related than it is a debating point that I've been saying in my own party, which is if you are so 
intent, or if we are so intent, or if voters are so intent, or if conservatives are so intent on dropping the retail side of the carbon tax, this means that we will have to rely more on the industrial carbon tax. The challenge with that, as someone who spends uh, two-thirds of their time in British Columbia and Alberta, is that, that that will ultimately transfer the burden of climate change from Ontario and Quebec to Alberta, BC, Saskatchewan. And the simple reason for that is that in Ontario, 60% of emissions are retail emissions and 40% are industrial emissions. This is rough numbers. But in Alberta, 70% of emissions are industrial emissions and 30% are retail emissions. So if you get rid of the retail carbon tax, you are now asking Western Canada to play a much bigger role. It's surprising to me that a party that I helped build as an advisor to Stephen Harper for many years doesn't quite get the fact that if they get rid of the retail carbon price, and rely more heavily on an industrial carbon price or industrial pricing or the industrial sector, that that ultimately will be problematic for the place where we get the most votes. It's a bit interesting, if not curious. <laughs> My third point is that industrial carbon pricing is here to stay. And I think there are a few reasons for that. The first reason for that is that industrial carbon pricing was designed uh, mostly in Alberta, and not just under the NDP, who just finished the job started by conservatives before them. It was conservatives in Alberta who designed an industrial carbon price. It was conservatives in British Columbia, for whom I have privileged to do some work. It was conservatives in British Columbia who designed a carbon tax. And, it, it, um, and the industrial sector themselves want the certainty that comes from an industrial carbon price. Now, Ben Dacus is in the room, and I'm going to give him credit for this insight, which is that the most, one of the more interesting things about the industrial carbon price is that it has created supporters within almost every sector of the economy. Because in each sector, if you're a low average emitter, you're a winner, and if you're a high average emitter, you're a loser. And so there are people who are winning, in other words, profiting from the fact we have an industrial carbon price, even though governments, interestingly enough, collect almost nothing from the industrial carbon price because of our offset base allocations and our other things. This was actually a surprise to me. I'm writing a piece with a bunch of people right now. And to learn that our industrial carbon price in Canada actually isn't growing the size of government is a, is a curious and interesting thing because it's all working on the margins. But what's interesting about the industrial carbon price is we've got now a group of companies across the country who are benefiting from it because they're higher average emitters than companies who are losing from it, who, sorry, low average emitters than the high average emitters. We actually have people lobbying in favor of carbon, the industrial carbon price. And so I don't think it's going anywhere. Daniel Smith herself is committed to going to $170 on the industrial carbon price. And so I think the industrial carbon price is here to stay. My fourth point is made, and it's my strongest argument, and it comes entirely from a report that Rick's wonderful organization put out this morning. And Dale, hi, I'm sure he's watching. Dale Began, one of the most brilliant climate analysts in the country, I understand, is the, the brains, sorry, I can't, but is the brains behind this, uh, and is a brilliant guy. And just in case you haven't read it, here's what the report indicates. What the report does is it lays out how much of our emission reduction will come from various kinds of industrial policy. And it says that between somewhere between 20 and 48 percent of our emission reduction will come from the industrial sector. Um, the cap on oil and gas will produce 7 to 34 percent. Methane reductions, by the way, you can't price methane reductions, so to the extent we have industrial carbon policy f f focused on methane, the reason for that is you can't capture methane within an industrial policy within the industrial carbon tax. So we need separate policies to deal with methane, so I'll make one exception on industrial, carbon price, on, on industrial policy for methane. Um, clean fuel standards, zero to four uh, percent. The various investment tax credits that you like so much, two to three percent. Uh, and ZEV mandates, 2%, okay? Now, it's a wonderful report. I'm glad you did it. 
it indicates the various degrees of things that will contribute to our climate policy. And Dale, I hate to do this, but I have a huge criticism of this report, which is it just says how much each of these will contribute. What it doesn't do, and you anticipated me saying this, it doesn't tell us what the relative costs of each of these are to contribute to, to our climate reduction. Now, when I was part of EcoFiscal, am I allowed to say that, Chris? When I was part of EcoFiscal, I was there from the ground. I was there at that meeting you referenced. We had, it was a fun meeting. Um, one of the things EcoFiscal did is calculate the implicit carbon price of various non-carbon priced uh, in, in environmental policies. And they found, if my memory is correct, that ZEV mandates or, or these kinds of mandates was like $400 implicit carbon price. So Rick and Dale, wherever the camera is, hi Dale, um, I really think it's important that you do a second round of this study and put beside each of these things, what's the relative carbon price of each of these things? Because if the cap on oil and gas, if the relative carbon price of a cap on oil and gas is $600 or $300 or $800, but the carbon price is $80, that's an incredibly inefficient way for us to reduce emissions. If we need to raise the industrial carbon price from 80 to 120 to 150, let's do it. Because that is providing the, a consistent incentive across the economy to reduce, in, to reduce emissions. And all of this fooling around with industrial policy that only contributes 2 to 3%, if the cost of that is four to $500 of an implicit carbon price, it's dumb. It's not just bad because governments are terrible at it. It's dumb from a purely economic perspective. So my friend, game on. All right. You guys have been pretty good in terms of holding to time. Um, now we have rebuttals. Five minutes yes. each. Yes. Yes, I'm ready to rebut. Um, well, thank you, Ken, for plugging our report. Um, I, I appreciate that, uh, uh, and I agree, it's a fantastic report. I believe that perhaps the key difference between my perspective and my friend's perspective is that I want to use all the tools in the climate change toolbox. He wants to throw away some of the tools for arcane philosophical reasons. It's as if we were building a house together, and I have a tool belt full of excellent tools, an array of lithium-ion battery-powered tools, <laughs> all of which I use, and he's poking along with a wood chisel. That's the, that's the difference, I think, between our arguments. Uh, uh, in my world, and, and uh, in, in terms of, in terms of uh, our report today, uh, I actually agree that, that there are, uh, you know, our organization is a fierce partisan of industrial carbon pricing. Uh, it's true that industrial carbon pricing is, is the linchpin of, of decarbonization in this country, but it cannot do the job alone. Uh, one, of the, one of the messages of our report today uh, is that, uh, that there needs to be a greater focus on the basket of policies that have been created uh, by sector, because each sector is slightly different, requires a, a different approach uh, uh, in terms of geography across this country, with due deference to the uh, the federation that we live in. So there, we're not just, we're never just talking when we're talking climate policy. We're never just talking federal government. There's a provincial role. There's an important municipal role. So there is there is at this point a developing architecture of climate policy in our country, some regulation, some market-based policy that we're very supportive of, and some industrial policy. And in fact, uh, some, of the, some of the green industrial policy, if you look around the world, um, a lot of it actually has baked into it market-based approaches. So the European Green Plan, for instance, uh, that, uh, that has Europe on a very ambitious, successful uh, uh, decarbonization trajectory uh, a, uh, a, a dramatic growth in the wake of the Ukraine war, a dramatic growth of domestic renewable energy production. Part of that plan uh, is, uh, is emissions trading. 
uh, and a very robust, uh, very robust market-based approach. But there are also regulatory and uh, and and industrial policies uh, uh, in there as well. Um, perhaps the last thing I'll say is Ken. Uh, as I understand it, core to Ken's argument is that we should start with a market-based approach and then say, okay, uh, what can the market not deliver? And then he'll grudgingly uh, admit that perhaps there needs to be another policy to, uh, to shore up that market deficiency. Well, I would, I would, I would suggest that uh, one well-known uh, market deficiency uh, is innovation. There's a rich economic literature on this, uh, and the reason, of course, is because uh, there is a conflict between the greater social goods often created by invention uh, and the fact that uh, those inventions, the, that, that profit doesn't accrue to the original inventor. It's a classic, classic um, uh, thing that markets don't get, uh, don't get right. That's why there's a long, long history of, uh, of government um, de-risking innovation of, uh, of uh, uh, entities like the Canada Growth Fund, trying to crowd in uh, uh, financing, uh, a, a clear role for government in that regard. And I would suggest when it comes to innovation, that challenge is turbocharged by the climate challenge. Because by definition, we need to uh, build a world that's never existed before. We need to aspire to an industrial transition the likes of which we've never seen. And so um, a lot of what I'm talking about, I think, uh, revolves around this uh, market, uh, the, the fact that markets have never been able to handle innovation well, have needed complementary policies, uh, and that's certainly the case when it comes to climate change. Yeah, my general response to your last point is what markets do badly, governments do worse. But let me, let me, uh, let me talk about your three uh, arguments off the top as this is rebuttal to that. On point number one, I will grant what you said, my hair may be less on fire than yours on the severity of the issue, but I agree that climate is a serious issue. Um, I'm now changing my vacation plans to my BC place because you can't go there in July because you can't ride your bike, in the, you can't mountain bike in July because there's too much smoke. So you have to go in September and October. So we're well aware of, of the challenges and issues. So I'll grant you that completely. Um, number two, you listed a bunch of issues that weren't climate issues and suggested that climate policy or industrial policy should some, somehow solve these issues. So the gas issue in, 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 uh, in Europe and the solution to that was a gas problem in Europe and the solution to that was what they did. It doesn't really seem to follow from me that those are arguments in favor of using industrial policy for climate change. It's using industrial policy to solve a separate a separate series of issues and challenges. So uh, I'm not sure I grant that that was a very good argument at all, my cousin. Um, on the third one, which I, which I will summarize perhaps incorrectly as everyone has given up on the, on the retail carbon price, so it's time to just give up on the retail carbon price. Uh, a small story, as some of you may or may not know, I was very involved with Christy Clark, uh, her leadership race and, and later in her office. And one of the first things before I became converted to carbon pricing was I went to British Columbia and I said, uh, Madam Clark, if you want to be leader of this party, we should shore up the conservative side of the vote because you have a bit of too much red in your history uh, by canceling the carbon tax in BC. And she said, I think you should do some polling and find out what people think in BC. And so we did a bunch of polling in BC and to my Great interest and surprise when we talked to right of center voters about canceling the carbon tax, their response was, but then my taxes are going to go up. Because Gordon Campbell, unlike Justin Trudeau and others, created a direct link between the carbon price that he introduced and the tax cuts that they paid for. And the people in British Columbia understood very well that if the carbon tax was going to go away, their taxes would go up. And so I think that if Justin, and goodness, I don't really give Justin Trudeau advice, but if I were to try and save the national uh, retail carbon price, I would calculate how much money an $80 price would generate across the country uh, as of April 1st, an $80 carbon price across Canada would generate, a retail carbon price would generate $20 billion. The GST generates five fifty billion billion, two points off the GST, uh, is $20 billion, and I would get cancel the rebates, 
cut the GST by 2% and challenge Mr. Polyev to raise the GST in order to get rid of the retail sales tax. I was part of the Harper team that introduced a 2% cut in the GST. And although the 2004 platform was a thing of beauty that delivered income tax cuts and all kinds of under wonderful things, as Mr. Harper frequently reminds me, the 2004 platform didn't result in us forming government. The 2006 platform with a 2% GST cut certainly did. And if you're serious, that serious about keeping a retail carbon price, you'd find a way to make it politically difficult, much more politically difficult than the fake rebates that Mr. Polyev currently talks about, uh, people not receiving, which we know they do. You'd convert those rebates into a 2% GST cut. And by the way, you just have to increase the GST credit by 25%, and the distributional impacts are almost exactly the same as the current rebate. Um, so that's my response to your uh, third question is, uh, you guys give up way too easy um, when faced with a little criticism from people on the other side of the aisle. They haven't hit each other yet. This is good. <laughs> uh, at least not physically. Um, so I'm going to push a little bit. I'm going to push. Uh, I have a couple of, of potentials here. Um, so one, and this is partly because I, 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 I do have a bit of a bias, but you kind of threw a dig at the oil and gas industry as being the real laggards in emissions reductions. The biggest supporter right now of maintaining a carbon price is actually the oil sands. The reason for that is the, get the Dale's <coughs> numbers associated with the, um, the emissions cap. Um, the emissions cap is not actually what it's going to m make for massive reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. It will be the pathways uh, n the, the oil sands pathways to net zero alliance and use of primarily carbon capture, but a bunch of other technologies. And I will say that industry has been for decades reducing certainly in t emissions intensity. I don't see people driving, I mean, sure, some of people are driving electric vehicles, but right now an EV in Alberta is not necessarily a clean car <coughs> just because you have to figure out where the electricity comes from. Um, you know, I don't even want to start on the methane associated with hydroelectricity because there's a, actually a hell of a lot of methane. The last number I saw, more greenhouse gas emissions come from the methane from uh, dammed up water on hydroelectric uh, facilities globally than the entire aviation industry. But we're not talking about it. So my push on this is is a little bit of... Um, you talked about Fed Prov. We're a, we're a federation, and it's really hard to get along. My push on this is, what's Canada's role? We're we're a climate taker. We're not a climate maker in Canada. Um, and greenhouse gas emissions, climate doesn't particularly adhere to political borders. Um, and there's an awful lot of stuff going on in the rest of the world that is challenging a little bit, uh, you know, our competitiveness, our ability to gain the prosperity from some of our resources. Is it is it our role to make those pretty significant sacrifices if the major emitters and, and a whole lot of countries, by the way, who might like to reduce their emissions but just don't have the, the economic wherewithal, is that Canada's role? Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I... My, my perspective on the oil and gas industry is I just want the industry to get on with what it says it wants to do anyway. That's all. So, I, I, uh, so arithmetically, if you, one, one of the things that we do is uh, we look at uh, decarbonization pathways by sector. And we project into the future and we say, OK, uh, the, the policies currently on offer, what are they going to do to uh, decarbonization in this sector? And in our latest analyses, what we see is that uh, things are actually in the ballpark of being on track for the transportation sector uh, because, of, uh, because of market penetration of electric vehicles, uh, because of a variety of policies currently in operation. Uh, uh, elect electrification, the electricity sector, uh, in the ballpark of being on track in terms of its necessary decarbonization trajectory towards net zero by 2050. The two sectors where things are not on track <clears throat> and so clearly there needs to be a policy remedy, uh, oil and gas and buildings, uh, where they're kind of stuck and, and they're not decarbonizing, decarbonizing as they should. <clears throat> I'm a patriotic Canadian. 
Uh, I would like Canadian oil and gas to be selling into the international market 20 years from now. Uh, my concern is that uh, uh, Canadian oil from the oil sands is second only to Venezuela in terms of emissions per barrel at the moment. And so in, in, a, in a world that is shortly about to materialize, if, if you believe uh, IEA projections, which we do, uh, we are very close to peak oil um, and, uh, and a whole new ball game in terms of uh, the international oil market. And Can <clears throat> Canadian oil uh, better be uh, cleaner in that context. Uh, and so our, our hope with oil and gas, we, we, and I, I take your point about, uh, you know, there's no fiercer partisans supporting industrial carbon pricing than the oil industry, and we... And, we I'll, actually, and I'll explain why. And we, actually, and we actually talk to them a lot about that, and I look forward in this next, in this next year uh, or two to really work with them closely on, on that topic. But, you know, when, when, when the Canadian oil industry returned $29 billion dollars uh, uh, in share buybacks and uh, you know a lot of their free cash flow went back to shareholders in 2022 as opposed to being invested in accelerated decarbonization that's what we find concerning we just want the Canadian oil and gas industry to get a move on decarbonizing as it says it wants to so so it has for decades and we'll, we can we'll talk about that and it, it's it's actually not second only to venezuela anymore thank you to to at least a 25 percent reduction in prints intensity per barrel it used to be bad no question but it's a lot better now but my point about the pathways to net zero alliance and why the support for carbon pricing is that that's like a 20 to 30 billion dollar investment there's a real fear in the pathways to net zero, and then it's net zero by 2050. It's not, you know, it's, no. it's not nothing. Like, that happens, that will be by far and away the biggest single reduction of GHGs in, in, in Canadian history, which is actually pretty pretty significant. The goal absolutely is to be the, the lowest, the cleanest barrel available internationally. Well, that would be great. But if the next federal government gets rid of the carbon price, then all of the financial analyses for that kind of project goes out the window because an awful lot of it is dependent on carbon credits that are tied to carbon pricing. So if the carbon credit regime, the carbon pricing goes, carbon credit regime goes, that whole thing goes out the window, which is why the oil sands have been working for all, three years now on the whole contracts for difference from the government to turn it into commercial, and that hasn't happened yet. So they can't spend the money yet because they still do not have that commitment from the federal government, which is frustrating because contracts for difference are used and have been used for years in the UK and a variety of other ju jurisdictions. So it's just not clear why because everybody wants to do this i can guarantee those companies wanted to be spending way more money way sooner but you know it, it, so, it's frustrating so there's a reason you're between us not just because you're the moderator but your position is is part of mine and part of rick's yeah i think yeah. because you say the oil sands alliance needs an investment tax credit so my question to the oil sands alliance is what level of carbon prices would we need to have so you wouldn't need to have an itc in order to build your carbon capture and storage i think it's a valuable question to ask and maybe we should move to that price quicker if that's what it's going to take instead of billions of dollars out of our coffers to to um uh to make that happen so i i, I think i think that's the comeback i think i think the Polyev should very soon commit to an industrial carbon price. I think, every, you know, Daniel Smith has, uh, my, you know, Doug Ford now runs the industrial carbon pricing regime in Ontario. And so it's actually not the federal government that does this. But let me make one more point about the, about the oil and gas industry. Um, you know, the U.S. Uh, is, is a net exporter, has been for the last number of years as a result of a bunch of stuff that they found. Uh, they're likely to move back to being a net importer. But now would be a great time to talk to the United States about a border carbon adjustment. Um, regime that makes sure that if and when our oil and gas and their oil and gas is produced at higher environmental standards than global oil and gas, that those global players pay at the border for their less clean oil and gas. Um, I don't. I could talk about contracts for differences. I think they're economically sound. They're politically ridiculous, but um, but 
the border carbon adjustment debate is is something we should move on. The border carbon adjustment is a complicated thing to figure out, but it's consistent with carbon pricing. And what it does is it imposes a carbon price on people that want to bypass your domestic carbon price to get their products into the market. And if we can get the U.S. and Canada and North American border carbon adjustment, we'd be a long way to solving these problems um, without having to get rid of uh, our 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 uh, regime. So before we go to the audience, I'm going to push on you now on, on in terms of market. And I, I'm very much a, a, a supporter of the market making an awful lot of, of appropriate decisions, but not all of them. And one of the things that I think sets Canada apart in terms of ultimately over the next number of years, people see e ESG and I see people raise their eyebrows and I go, wait a, guy, wait a second, e ESG is a huge bonus for Canada because on almost all metrics, we're world leading, right? We have rule of law, we have um, you know, all sorts of government governance and social and frankly get our emissions down in the oil sands and on the E part will be amazing too. So this is a, a really good thing for us. A big part of that is our regulatory environment. A big part of it is that we have environmental regulations, not just for, for, for uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we have environmental regulations that are, uh, believe it or not, world leading. You know, our mining industry, people may not like it very much, but frankly, in, in, in terms of global standards, we're, we are world leaders. That has come because of regulations. We don't let mercury go into the river streams anymore. We, we um, do forestry now way better than we used to. Those didn't happen because of market drivers. Those things, those improvements, and those things that I think, I, as a Canadian, I'm very proud of, have come about because we've actually imposed regulation on some of the activities that we engage in. And for the most part, and we, you know me well enough, some of the overlap and the delays hugely problematic, but the fundamental, premises, fundamental premise is that we actually need the market and, strong and a strong regulatory environment. So I would argue that a lot of the things you're talking about are not necessarily climate related. And I think there are time, there are there's public policy challenges where you, where a price can solve a big part of your challenge, and there are public policy challenges that require more of a regulatory approach. And my I guess my argument is, you know, some of the things we do by regulation are much more difficult to just price in and let and then stand back. But in the case of carbon, we know how much carbon is in stuff, we know what the externality is, and we can price it. And so that's a much more elegant solution than the regulatory approach, which has, as you mentioned in a quick aside, all kinds of complicating and other factors. And so we need a regulatory approach to make sure that our Aboriginal Indigenous consultations are done properly, and to make sure that a bunch of other things happen that are much more difficult to price. But on the on the carbon side of things, if carbon emissions are the issue, I just still think that that a price on carbon is a much more efficient way to reduce them and and spread the burden across the economy in the most fair and equitable way than doing it by a regulatory approach. And so I just I think there's a bit of I think your 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 challenge to me is a bit of an apples and oranges thing because the things that you're talking about regulating are not necessarily carbon based and I think carbon and reducing carbon as an environmental policy like is something we should use pricing for even if I agree that there are many regulatory things we can do to accomplish other goals but on carbon I'm just not willing to concede that territory yet Fair point. I guess there's, there's two aspects to green industrial policy, right? One, one is uh, uh, emissions reduction, but then the other one is economic growth. And uh, the reason that I think things like the Inflation Reduction Act are popular today is because they, it's, it's the type of policy re that responds to this moment. 50% you know, of Canadians uh, basically have, have zero net worth. They don't own anything net, right? Uh, affordability concerns. I mean, we just heard in the in the um, previous panel uh, on housing. If people that rent are concerned, people that have a mortgage are concerned. So affordability concerns are sky high. Uh, so there is this intense uh, angst about economic growth. Uh, 
uh, and what the Inflation Reduction Act does and what the Europeans are, are busily doing is, is equating renewable energy growth as the engine of, of economic growth. And I'm not sure why we wouldn't aspire to something similar in Canada. And in fact, we're quite excited about uh, if we just looked at electricity, for instance, highly regulated sector, very complicated, uh, uh, you know, independent except for one province, independent regulators, uh, all sorts of issues around transmission, uh, let alone supply. Um, and we're, uh, just in the last few years, the dawning awareness that clean electricity is a driver of investment. Um, you know, I had, I had an interesting, we had a meeting with the Ford government last year, who we actually have a very productive discussion with on electricity. Um, we were meeting with the, the um, energy minister's office and we, we were doing our whole song and dance on the virtues of clean electricity. Uh, and at one point, uh, the guy we were meeting with stopped us and he said, stop, stop, stop. He said, you don't need to convince me about clean electricity. I buy everything you're telling us, not because you're saying it, but because Volkswagen tells us that in order to locate in this province, they need a guarantee of clean electricity. Um, so that, that I think, that this, this notion of the, the binding together of economic growth and emissions reduction is what's happening in other jurisdictions. And I think as Canadians, we need to keep pace. Um, interesting. I, I, there is somebody at the mic, but you go, you go, I can see you're uh, like. I would just say again, if your objective is economic growth, that's a different objective than reducing carbon emissions. And I, then we can have a debate about what's the best for, for economic growth. But for carbon, you're not making an argument against using pricing only for carbon emissions. And I also worry, to be honest, we're at the front end of the IRA. In 20 years, I think we'll look back on the IRA and be able to evaluate. I mean, the U.S. is running running deficits at 7 8% of GDP and debt to GDP at 100%, and those are above the levels at which the, the Wall Street Journal called Canada an honorary member of the third world in 1993, and I was in Ottawa. So, like, let's be, let's be real about the costs and opportunities of these things. Sure, maybe it'll spark some economic activity, the IRA in the United States, but at what point can they stop being afforded what point can they not afford to pay for this stuff anymore? And at what point is that a better use of public resources than, than lower taxes and the other things? So I, again, I think we can debate that, but that's not climate policy, that's economic growth policy. We have some opinionated people at the microphones. We do, we do. So just as a reminder, please say who you are and just give us context. Sure. Hi, am I on? Yep. Great. My name is Alex Callahan. I'm the National Director of Health, Safety and Environment with the Canadian Labour Congress, which is a, Canada's national labour central. There's three million affiliated workers in every sector and every province, territory. Um, and so I have a, a couple of thoughts. The first is that we've had this discussion here without talking about what this means for the people who are actually going to be doing all of these jobs. Um, that, is a, that is a key part of two things. It's a key part of around growth and economic prosperity of the country. And it's also a key part of social license for this going forward. People can't see, um, can't see environmental policy as, as declining their quality of work. Industrial policy does say these are our objectives and these are investments in money and regulation, et cetera, that we're willing to put behind those things because we have an objective that is so important. Like Kennedy would not have sent people to the moon on market-based solutions alone, right? We have, there is a magnitude of the challenge that's ahead of us that for a long time, the trade union movement talked about no jobs on a dead planet. Like this is a really important objective for us. We wanna have future prosperity for workers. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, uh, some of the components here around job quality, around the fact that industrial policy can be a key way because, because like basically sticks alone aren't enough to say, uh, to, to say jobs should be coming with uh, a pension, which arguably comes back to our discussion about housing prices earlier, like the decline of pensions and what that's done to housing investment. But uh, a, the benefits of a union card, all of those things which build a middle class, like having a low carbon economy where people are not, where people don't have good jobs is, is not the solution that we want. We want to have a combination of good jobs where Canada is a leader, where our workers, our skilled workers are leaders, and we're meeting all of our ambitious climate targets, and those things have to be interlinked. And I think there is, I think that green industrial policy can be a key part of that. I look forward to some discussion. Sure. Um, so the objective is good middle-class jobs. That is not necessarily good, like, let me, let me start with what you said at the beginning. This climate, and you said this too, Rick, this climate emergency is so important 
that we ought to sacrifice efficiency to get it done. I would make the opposite argument. This climate challenge is so important that we ought to pay more, effect, more attention to what the most efficient outcome is. We ought to be more concerned about how to do this in the most efficient and, and best possible way. And so if this is a real, if this is a real existential crisis, we ought to be more concerned about doing this in the most efficient way as opposed to slapdash, well, I mean, not slapdash, but like, as opposed to excusing policy that's not efficient. Like, we should be more, let's get the carbon price up to 225 right away, right? And, you know, uh, Chris, I think Chris and I wrote this piece a number of years ago when the gas prices fell, our immediate argument was, well, let's boost the carbon price because people will just like, people won't notice. And when the gas price goes back up, it'll go back up. Like we miss political opportunities to increase the carbon price all the time. Again, you guys give up too easily. Um, and it surprises me. As to what, whether industri good industrial policy produces good jobs, sure, if you think government is better at the market at creating good jobs, then I understand your argument. I just don't buy it. Right, but we're not playing. We're not playing in a totally level playing field because the United States is making investments, for example, in in automotive. That if we don't play in that game, we're not seeing batteries. And, and, we're not and seeing right, focus. and I was there when Stephen Harper said I would not do this normally. But we, uh, sir, there's a competitive argument about us doing what the United States does. I think the United States won't be able to continue to do this stuff because their deficits and debt are now third world levels, according to the Wall Street Journal in 1994. So like they can't continue to do this forever. But we're not having an argument about climate when we're talking about what are the best arguments for good jobs. It's a different argument. It's a different set of policy tools. It's a different objective. You know, I, I, we're already bumping up, clearly, I mean, again, uh, just a statement of the obvious, uh, we're already bumping up against the political acceptability uh, of consumer, consumer carbon price. And uh, so going to two, 225 bucks a ton immediately the GST, ain't going to work. Gone. The GST is right? gone. And, and so the question is why, right? Why, why is there this intense worry about cost? And, and, and why, why do most Canadians, I mean, we can, I'm not gonna defend the current federal government's communications rollout in defense of the consumer carbon tax. Or but I do think, I do think it's, it's interesting. And, and just, just to reassure ourselves that we weren't crazy or we weren't defective as, uh, as carbon pricing advocates, we actually did a little, um, a little survey of the 30 or so jurisdictions around the world, nations around the world, that have consumer carbon taxes. And the punchline is, <clears throat> in every jurisdiction around the world, France, Sweden, Washington State, Australia, every, every jurisdiction around the world that has a consumer carbon price, the governments involved are having trouble defending it. So there's something about a consumer carbon price, and, and it doesn't matter if people get checks in the mail, it doesn't matter if they get regular updates, uh, that if it's revenue neutral, there's something too convoluted about consumer carbon pricing where you pay over here, but you get it back over here, and it's all supposed to be better for the planet. And I've tried to explain this to my dad half a dozen times, and it's convoluted. And so there's something much simpler about an industrial policy, like the Inflation Reduction Act that says, we are going to rebuild a manufacturing economy in this country. We're going to uh, uh, aim to create 1.5 million new jobs by 2030. Uh, we are going to incent mining on this continent because we don't want uh, other countries uh, controlling an entire global production of lithium. Uh, and so there's something at this moment anyway, more palatable about industrial policy arguments than solely market-based uh, uh, pricing arguments. There are lots of jurisdictions that also have historically provided major subsidies for gasoline. And a number of them in the last few years for the same reason, because it's, the, uh, it's, it's a carbon price but on the other side of the, the line. Um, and as far as I know, almost all of them have had to go back to subsidizing because it, people, people get pissed off. Um, at paying more, and and that's a sentiment, whether it's true or not. It's certainly a sentiment that politicians are are are, are trying to capitalize on. Um, over to that microphone, uh, David McGowan. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, I managed to launch a Canadian business for climate policy into the headwinds of the pandemic, uh, and uh, the organization was intended uh, to be a business voice uh, that would advocate for uh, greater consistency in climate policy. Um, we were somewhat successful, I think. Uh, so I, I, 
I'd like maybe almost to change the frame uh, around, you know, is this industrial policy or not, and really kind of broaden it to, to say, is, is the question really uh, not, these, these aren't efficient, necessarily efficiency arguments or market arguments or intervention arguments, but what and where is the appropriate balance between the costs that the private sector should incur and the costs that government should incur when we're thinking about um, you know, decarbonization or specifically, perhaps more specifically, around energy transitions. So if you think about the, uh, some of the, the actions that the Ford government did a couple, three years ago, uh, when they invested you know, $500, billion, $500 million uh, in Stelco to help them transition uh, to uh, electric arc furnaces. Um, so I guess I, the question I have to both Rick and to Ken is, at what point is it the appropriate role for government to support uh, businesses as they transition to uh, lower carbon futures, regardless if that's you know a carbon price or uh, direct subsidies, um, is there a is there a balance between the role that you know, private companies, the private sector, should take on, and the role that governments should take on? I would ask what the implicit carbon price is of the of the reduction you're talking about, and then say. Do we want a carbon price that's that high in order to incent them to do it? Or if we have a carbon price that's lower than that, then other other more cheap uh, uh, reductions in carbon prices will happen, and then there will be a credit system or a trading system that would take advantage of that. And so it's it, my 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 answer, which will not surprise you, is is the government should should as much as possible create incentives for people to do that without requiring the government to either regulate or provide cash to do that themselves. Because at some point, the government's going to run out of money. It doesn't run out of regulatory power, but then it stifles all kinds of innovation and growth that uh, apparently my friend uh, on the left loves so much. Um, but I'm on your right. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're on their left. Um, anyway, so, so I, I think that's like my, my starting point is always why is the market mechanism not work th working? Now, we know with carbon pricing, for example, it doesn't capture methane. And so we need a separate set of regulations for methane. The reason we need a separate set of regulations for methane is at a carbon price, and I don't understand the technicalities, but it can't capture that within the pricing regime. So that's an example where it makes sense to do it. And the regulatory, I don't know, Chris, if you remember the number, but the methane regulations that we have out, that Ecofiscal evaluated were, yeah, $70. $70? Seven dollars. So, like, clearly, those regulations made sense. You can't capture it in the market me mechanism. You have a regulatory approach. The implicit price is seven dollars. The carbon price is thirty dollars. It makes all kinds of sense. So, that's the framework that I would use for the f to answer your question. I mean, we've we we're very supportive of uh, investment tax credits, for instance, uh, that this government is rolling out. We hope to see some progress on them in in the next month's federal budget. Uh, we think that uh, some public support for decarbonizing is appropriate, uh, especially if you look at uh, what our trading partners are doing, where this is increasingly the, the price of admission uh, in terms of uh, heavy, heavy emitting industries. Uh, so uh, we've, we've done any number of things to sketch out the parameters of that. So we, uh, we held the pen on a transition, I mean, it's the worst, worst name of a document ever. It's the, the Transition Investment Taxonomy um, with the Sustainable Finance Action Council. But uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway, it's, it's, it's sort of a, uh, the beginnings of a definitional exercise as to, um, yeah, perhaps, perhaps one of the problems with this document is its unpronounceable name. But uh, uh, essentially, it's a definitional exercise to say, OK, what, what, what should qualify as green industrial activity or transition consistent activity and therefore benefit uh, from that label in terms of uh, capital allocation. Mm -hmm. um, so we, uh, you, know, you know, my answer, our answer to your question, David, is, is that there is, it is appropriate uh, at this moment in time as, as there's this unprecedented stampede towards decarbonization with all of our trading partners. There needs to be some public support for this activity if we want our cement and concrete industry, our steel industry, our oil and gas sector to remain competitive. 
So I'll leave just one final comment because, you know, Ken's talked about GST and there's like, if, uh, if good climate policy is good economic policy, then I think we uh, solve a, a lot of these challenges if we actually do a, a major rehaul of the tax system. Okay, when we entered World War II, we didn't turn to ask private sector to, you know, forego a whole lot. It was government for the most part, there are some exceptions, but there was a decision clearly made that we have a, a, an existential threat here and we're gonna fight it. Other countries obviously around the world were already engaged. Um, um, interesting analogy, I mean, some people refer to climate as being something that, you know, people use the moonshot in Kennedy, but other people say, is, is this not unlike uh, some of the world conflicts that we've had in the past? And so I, I think that's a very interesting part of that question, because we didn't have that question didn't come up when when the view was that much of an existential threat. We have two more. Can I ask you to just ask them both really quickly and then get these guys to address them both at the same time? And then, because we're already going a couple minutes, but I got a little wave that I could go a little bit more. But if you All can right. both ask and then and be fairly quick and these guys be quick in their answers. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. So uh, I'm Ahmed, I'm from BMO. Um, my question is in regards to the control frameworks around uh, the carbon pricing. So I've seen in the UK, um, carbon pricing has encouraged uh, the industries to offshore their emissions to places like China. And uh, the, uh, the outsourcing of carbon has been a big issue, right? Because at the end of the day, carbon emissions remain the same, even though in accounting, the carbon emissions from the UK has gone down. So what can we put in terms of control framework in Canada so that we don't face similar situations or um, carbon offshore, uh, sorry, carbon outsourcing or even labor outsourcing where we have lost all these manufacturing jobs or emissions um, to uh, countries where the uh, regulations are more lax? Hi, debaters. Uh, Michael Gulo, Business Council of Canada. Um, my question is around kind of capital formulation. Um, RBC estimates that our climate ambition to 2050 should be about a $2 trillion investment. Uh, you know, Ken is the market-based proponent. Rick is the industrial policy proponent. W w which policy pathway attracts capital faster at a rate of north of $100 billion per year? I'd love your views. <laughs> so the tier, the tier and the offset base allocation system by the federal government and the tier system in Alberta solves your problem because it's, it it covers off the trade exposed sectors. I learned something which I should have known, but I asked Trevor Toom yesterday how much a national uh, eighty dollar carbon price would collect on the retail side. He said twenty billion dollars. I said how much would if you took the tier system and applied it to all provinces across Canada, how much would it collect? The answer is one billion dollars. Like businesses are literally paying nothing. Okay, it's the it's the incentives on the margin um, and the interoperability. So and the offset base allocation system that we have offsets for those trade exposures, and so we're good. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, so, so Ken took this question. Maybe I'll take Michael's question. Uh, the uh, you know our, our colleagues at uh, Clean Prosperity did a great report where they where they you know rather than dealing with this big scary number, they tried to do an apples to apples comparison. Okay, if we want to attract investment for CCUS in Canada, for green hydrogen in Canada, for and they did they they looked at the mixture of. Uh, of instruments that we now have, industrial carbon pricing and um, ITCs, and they stack that up against uh, the types of support that the IRA offers. And the, you know, I th we found that very specific kind of uh, analysis useful because what it showed is that we're actually looking pretty good and in, in, we're looking pretty comparable in some areas and in other areas quite deficient and that then forces some, some conclusions in terms of cranking up ITCs or, um, as we point out in our report today, um, fixing problems with industrial carbon pricing and, uh, and really making sure it works better. Um, so I, you know, I, I think the answer, Michael, will depend on what sector we're looking at um, and, and what instruments uh, are at play uh, in those sectors. I have a much shorter answer. Whichever policy is more permanent or people believe will last for a long time. If Trump undoes, undoes all the ITCs in the United States, or if Polyev undo, undoes uh, industrial carbon pricing, that's a problem. 
right? So it's, it's not what policy is better in my view, it's which policy do people believe will be sustainable over the long term. And sadly, we have elections, so that becomes a real question. <laughs> I'm just kidding about sadly. I, on that happy note, um, sort of. Um, Chris? If, if like you're standing there, but can before- I have checked can, with the bosses can, at the upper <laughs> left, and there's time. <laughs> <laughs> but should I like ask everybody to thank these guys no, now, or are you no. actually asking I'd like another to ask, question? Ask a question. Oh, right. Then. I mean, you can thank them now, and then I can ask a question. No, you, you can go. thank them again. You go because I want to hear their answers before. You're the one. I you're the add. one that no, stacked the deck in terms of the description of our debate about 1970s style. My style question of industrial is policy. going to provide a social service and a service to both of the debaters. So, okay. there is a danger in a debate like this that you end up. Um, coming off, both of you, dug into a particular position, right? So one could listen to Rick and think that Rick believes that, you know, we want to use every tool in the toolbox and kind of no suggestion that any of those tools may not work. That was exactly my line, so I'm glad okay. that's stuck. I know, I know. No. I was listening. I was listening. Um, and you talked about trade-offs, right? There are some things that we care about that we should prepare to sacrifice a little efficiency for, okay? Ken sounded like, well, uh, let's use carbon pricing for everything. Um, he did accept methane regulations, um, but basically it was, you know, Ken has never met a, a non-pricing government policy that he would like to use. So I don't want you guys to go down there and have a glass of wine and nobody comes up and talks to you because they think you're extremists, okay? So I want you, I want you, I, I want to give you an opportunity to show everybody in the room that you're actually more moderate than your positions. So here's my specific question to each of you. Rick, you're first. So Rick, if you would like to possibly use every tool in the box, I would like to know which tools you wouldn't use. Could you name two policies that maybe exist in some other country that you just think aren't a good idea. Maybe they're too expensive. Maybe the government just can't do them. Maybe they just don't work for some reason. But is there something that you wouldn't do? And I'd like to know what the principle is that, that leads you to, to identify those two. And Ken, uh, you're not allowed to use methane regs, but I'd like you to identify two non-pricing policies that maybe you would be prepared to accept because maybe there are some limitations to carbon pricing. Maybe you would recognize that. So can Rick name two things that we shouldn't do, industrial policy type things that we shouldn't do, and Ken, can you name two things that maybe it's okay to do? He's good, eh? He is I, good. Well, I'm gonna ignore his question. <laughs> And, 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 and talk about what I want to talk about, which is, um, which is slightly related. But uh, I, think, I think you're kind of, well, the, this debate was, if you look at the description, was kind of set up to imply that industrial policy just kind of means government spending money on stuff, you know? Or like just a big chunk of change, we're just gonna bribe this company to come to our jurisdiction to make stuff and then we're gonna call it a day and we're gonna call that industrial policy. And to get to your question, I mean, I don't think, there's lots of examples of that kind of thinking out there in our country and in other countries. Um, and I, I am not up for that kind of thinking. I, I don't think that makes any sense. That's a, that st stands the chance of being a bad bet. So what I would, what I would say is, is what I mean by green industrial policy is something more strategic, something more transparent, uh, something uh, that, ha that solicits uh, input from key constituencies like trade unions. Um, so there, is, there, is, there needs to be a structure uh, and a mindfulness to industrial policy for it to qualify as what I'm talking about. So, uh, you know, the kinds of crazy, you know, throwing good money after bad that we've, that we've seen in previous years, that doesn't make any sense. So I've talked a couple times about the implicit carbon price in things, and I think an example of, so I think that's the, that's the evaluation framework that I would use for this policy. And an example where it makes sense is we did a lot of shutting down of 
uh, coal-fired plants and shutting down of coal, and and Harper did a bunch of sh you know frameworks around that. And I again, I believe we evaluated the Ecofiscal evaluated this and said that the implicit carbon price of doing the policy was somewhere in the range of fifty to seventy-five dollars. Well, if we know the carbon price is going to go to a hundred. And we know that the implicit carbon price of this policy is 50 to $75, but we're not going to get to 100 for 10 years. Why don't we just start that now if there's a way for us to do it reasonably efficiently? So I think, again, it's the, it's the evaluation framework for me that matters. So we can do things, but we better be saying we're doing it because we're just accelerating something that will get done later. And by doing it now, we're just getting some, some short wins or easy wins or, or you know, uh, cutting off the tall poppies or whatever you want, however, whatever, whatever analogy you want to use. But it's that evaluation framework that I think is so important because so often I think, I mean, again, Chris, you, you and I, not to rope you into these arguments, but you and I wrote a piece a while ago saying that the federal government has got like billions of dollars in green policies over the next 25 years and it's laid out like 60 different policies to do X, Y, and Z, but there's no evaluative framework to say which ones make sense and which ones don't. And there's no economic or, or other framework, just, just like, then we're gonna do this, 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 we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. But there's no evaluation to say, we're doing this because we know the carbon price is gonna go to $170, it makes sense at $150, so why don't we just get started now? That, to me, is a good argument. But just saying, here's a list of 200 policies that we're gonna do, and it's gonna cost us a bunch of money, just seems to me to be lazy policy making. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm almost feeling like I should get out of the middle so you guys can have a hug. <laughs> like we hug all the time. Anyway, Every could you please? I actually that was profoundly a disagree thing. with him on many things. I, 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 you know, yeah, for real. Yeah, well. Oh yeah. Um, um, Completely wrong. <laughs> on a lot of stuff. Okay, okay, stop while we're ahead. Um, that was great, Chris. Thanks. Could you please join me in thanking um, these guys?